the thought of when bad things happen to good people. Uh, it's not a question of if, because it will happen. Uh, it's not a question of why, because uh, it's a sort of a, a wrong type of way to even paraphrase or to put that question down in regards to why bad things happen. When we hear that phrase, why do bad things happen to good people, uh, because we're a meaning-seeking people, uh, we always sort of come to the conclusion or we sort of uh, process events uh, in regards to how it means to us, how it affects us. Uh, if something happens good that affects me in a good way, then that was good. Uh, if something happens to me that affects me in a bad way, then that becomes bad. And so that's why good and bad is sort of a relevant term because uh, you getting a, we're, we're working the same job and uh, uh, you get the promotion and I don't, well that's bad for me, but that's you know, good for you. And uh, we're both trying to compete for that same type of position. So when we look at this thought of bad things happen to good people, we've looked at several thoughts this, the, this past week that I want to just give you quickly. We'll build on that. Number one, I said this, you'll have trouble. That's a guarantee. You will have trouble. That is a guarantee. Job tells us, man that is born of a woman is few days and full of trouble. And so life is full of trouble. We live in a sinful world, a fallen world. And so get away from the idea that once I become a Christian, once I accept Christ my Savior, that all my problems will be gone. No more hurts, no more problems, no more heartaches, no more difficulties I'm going to face in life. No, you will have problems. Everyone has troubles. The challenge, the difference though we have is now we don't have to go through those problems by ourselves. We have God with us. He'll never leave us, never forsake us. His presence is with us through those hard times. I said, secondly, bad things do happen to good people. Bad things do happen to good people. That's an unfortunate but inevitable part of life. And uh, some of the best people that we know, many of you, uh, go through many, many hard things. And, and so bad things do happen to good people. I, I made this uh, observation last week. Uh, when, we, when we state that uh, things happen to us and, and you know, why do bad things happen to uh, good people, we sort of uh, get the idea that, that uh, it's really something that's focused on me doing something wrong. When really it has nothing to do with me doing something right or wrong. It just means we live in a sinful world. And, uh, you know, even the best of parents uh, raise up children that rebel. Even the best of husbands and wives uh, find out that their spouse has been unfaithful. Even good people uh, lose their jobs and uh, have foreclosures on their homes. And even good people uh, get cancer. And even good people die uh, at the hands of others. And so don't think just because something bad happens to you or someone else. And that was a question that was given in Luke chapter 13. They were asking, why did this event happen? These were innocent people going to sacrifice and, uh, and they were killed. This building fell over and innocent 18 people died. Why? Why do was tragic things happen to good people? So you'll have trouble. That's a guarantee. Bad things do happen to good people. And then I mentioned this also. Free will is a part of God's plan. Free will is a part of God's plan. You see, God did not create suffering and evil, but he did create through giving us a free will the potential for that suffering to come into the world. And so God doesn't create pain, God doesn't create suffering, but because we have a free will, the potential for pain can come into this world because of some choices that we make or choices that others may make that puts us in that position. Then fourthly, I, I finalize where we finish on this thought, uh, the question itself uh, is faulty. The question itself of why does bad things happen uh, to good people uh, is a faulty question because it assumes that some people are inherently good, worthy of something good happening, and others are inherently bad, uh, meaning that they're worthy or deserving of something bad happening to them. Uh, if you remember the verse we looked at in Romans 3, the Bible says, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good. And so the truth of the matter is, there are no good people, there are no bad people, there's just sinners, and that's what we are. And, and so there's no such thing as, well, he's a bad person, no, he's a sinner. He's a good person, no, he's a sinner. And uh, the only difference between a believer and an unbeliever, those are going to heaven, those aren't going to heaven, is that not that we're not sinners, or not that we don't sin, but because we're what? We're saved sinners. We're forgiven sinners. We've received Christ our Savior. So for you to think, well, why does bad things happen to good people? Now, what are we implying? We're implying ourselves. Why did that happen to me? Or something that we love and care about. Why did that happen to them? Well, number one, there are no good people. None of us are good. None, none that dwell upon the earth. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, even our righteousnesses in Isaiah are as filthy rags. The best good that we could ever do uh, in God's eyes 
is as filthy rags. And so we understand that, and we're all sinners, and so the, the question itself uh, is faulty. Now, let me give you this uh, other couple of thoughts here this morning as we build on this thought of when bad things happen to good people. Here's the next thought. My perception of good, my perception of good is not an accurate evaluation of what is good. My perception of good is not an accurate evaluation of what is good. Just because something seems to me to not be good does not mean that it's not good. Now, I don't see it as being good. It doesn't seem to me as being something that's beneficial, but just because I can't see it, just because it doesn't make sense to me, just because it doesn't seem to me that it's not good, that doesn't conclude the fact that it's not good because it doesn't seem good to me. Sometimes the things that God does, they don't seem to be good to us, but they are good. Uh, take your Bibles and let's go to Genesis chapter number 50, the first book in our Bible. Uh, and uh, think about the last chapter of Genesis in Genesis chapter 50. We have this story. I'll give you a little background before we read the verse there in Genesis chapter 50. Uh, but here's a story. Joseph was a young boy, teenage boy, 17 years of age. Just a young man, and uh, the Bible tells us through the story and summarizing it, his brothers sold him into slavery. They were very jealous of him. Uh, they thought he was a favorite. They thought he, uh, you know, the dad, and it was, you know, sort of always uh, showed some favoritism to him. And so they were very jealous of Joseph, and uh, so they sold him into slavery. This caravan of Ishmaelites were passing through, and they were the ones that ended up uh, buying young Joseph. He's carried off into Egypt. Egypt in the Bible is always a picture of the world, is a picture of going away from God, uh, being out of God's presence. Of course, God's always with us, but from all figurative um, uh, uh, ideologies and innuendos, it gives the impression that the Egypt is away from God, is going towards the world. And so they took Joseph to Egypt, and there, while in Egypt, he's lied about by Potiphar's wife, and, uh, and because of that lie, where she said he had come unto her, and, he, and she was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, forced himself upon her, and that was not true, he lied about her, he was thrown into prison, into the dungeon, and, uh, and stays in prison, finally becomes the prime minister of Egypt. I'm sure that many times Joseph felt uh, unfairly treated, and this just doesn't seem right. I've done nothing wrong. I've just tried to be an obedient son to my dad, and my brothers are jealous at me. They've sold me into slavery. I've just tried to be a good worker for my boss, and his wife's lied about me, and I've been in jail. And, and so he's gone through this whole process. He's now worked his way up to be the prime minister, the second in command uh, under the king there in Egypt. And so we see there, notice in Genesis 15, verse number 20, he, sa he summarizes his life of injustices in this verse Genesis 50 verse 20 but as for you he's talking about his brothers as they came back as you you thought evil against me but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save many people alive you see what seems bad uh, can be of good if God is orchestrating those things for his purpose and his plan. And so though he looked at it and says, this isn't fair, this is unjust, this isn't right, God saw it as good, and so my perception of what is not good does not confirm or validate that something's not good just because that's the way I see it. And so Joseph was able to summarize his life, saying, you know what, what you thought bad against me, what you thought evil against me, God was working for good. God had a good plan in that event. Uh, many times you'll hear of uh, different uh, hardships that come into a person's life. Maybe you go through a financial reversal. Uh, maybe you go through some physical uh, challenges and health issues. Uh, maybe uh, uh, you, you go through uh, uh, some uh, uh, life that you live and you get uh, arrested and incarcerated and you get to a bad place in your life. But guess what? Oftentimes it's in that bad spot, that low place, that low valley in your life where God then begins to work in your heart and you come to know Jesus as your Savior. And it's that very difficult time, that very deep time, that very heartful time that you then found God in that point was a good thing. And how many people had gotten saved in jail? They got saved because they're in the bottom of the barrel. They got saved in a hard time in their life. They came to know Jesus. And so that which was bad ended up being, wow, you know what? That was really the best thing. I've heard people say, you know, going to jail, that was the best thing that could have happened to me because it was there while in jail, a seemingly bad place 
that I met Jesus. It's there that I gave, got my first Bible. It was there that uh, I found out about Jesus' love for me. And so we can see that time and time again. So it was God that brought that caravan of slave traders. It was God that caused the famine in Israel. It was God that overruled the life of Potiphar's wife. And that's why it says very carefully in Romans chapter 8 that all things work together for good. Not that all things are good, but God can take anything that comes to your life and he can work it all together for good. In of itself, the ingredient of baking powder is not good. And uh, maybe uh, in of itself, flour is not good. And in of itself, uh, maybe that uh, salt is not good or that uh, egg is not good. And uh, all by themselves, it's not good. But yet, mix it all together and uh, work it all together. And it produces something good and uh, something beneficial as a result of that. And so the point of the message or the thought of this is um, things that are good, the point is not that things that, that are good. It's that God is good. And in his goodness, he'll work all things for good. And so you look at a situation and say, well, how in the world is this good? It's not. But God is always good. And because God's always good, he's always working together, mixing those ingredients together for your good, for his purpose, and ultimately for his glory to be magnified in all this done. And so we've got to be careful and, and, and to not use absolute terms to describe relative things. Uh, in other words, how I perceive something does not mean that my perception is accurate or right. I can't be absolute and say, oh yeah, this was bad, this was wrong, this wasn't good, and be absolute because it might be very relative in relation to what God is trying to accomplish and what God's going to use and work for his good. We hear it often said, uh, maybe you've even said it, in a disagreement or conflict, perception is reality. Perception is reality. If you perceive someone do, doing something wrong to you, then that to you is reality. And we've, we've often maybe have termed, used that term or heard that term. And so that term often is used to justify a perception that may be objectively unjustifiable or just plain out of touch with reality. So we look at someone and they make a wrong choice and we say, but you know, to them, perception is reality. That's how they perceived it. And because they perceived it that way, that's the way they made that decision based on that perception. And so the decision they made isn't that bad because because that's how they perceived it. Now that sort of minimizes the responsibility that comes with decisions we make because it says perception is reality and therefore it excuses the choices or decisions that we make as a result of that. So the phrase perception reality found its origin in a political strategic by the name of Lee Atwater. He worked for George Bush Sr. political campaign in 1988. Atwater helped Bush reclaim a 17-point deficit to win the 1988 presidential election. Atwater held that if one could lead the populace to believe something as being true, then that person's perception of the truth becomes reality to that group. Thus it mattered less what was true than what people thought was true. And, and we certainly see that even in the politics of today. That What are they trying to do? They're trying to perform a, or, or establish a what? Perception. Let's ignore the truth. Let's look at what perceives to be the truth. And now perception now overrules truth. And so now we base our decisions based on what perceives to be truth. Not just perception of truth, but what the media wants us to perceive truth to be, what our co-workers want us to perceive truth to be, what the world wants us to perceive truth to be. And that's why the Bible says we've got to allow the Word of God, the only absolute truth, to decide for us what is truth, what is right, and what is wrong. And so others, though, have furthered Atwater's assessment to claim that perception really means more than reality. That is, a person's belief about what is true matters more than what is actually true. If this statement is understood correctly, then it seems to be a situation in which truth is altered to meet the needs of the one promoting a certain perception. And so in other words, it means this. That's the way I see him, therefore it's true. And so perception is reality is not true. 
That's not an accurate statement uh, because uh, perception does not, your perception of right and wrong doesn't decide what's right and wrong. And, uh, but that's what uh, the thought is when we use that. This is the way I see it, and uh, because this is the way I see it, then it's right uh, or it's wrong based upon my perception of that. And so despite the popularity of this statement, it's not truthful because perception is not reality. How many times have we seen something or perceived something and it wasn't true? But our perception, we were convinced it was true. I mean, uh, you know, it was obvious that that was wrong and they did wrong and they were in the wrong place at the wrong time and they were in the wrong environment, the wrong situation. Our perception was this and we come to find out we were wrong. As a parent, I've done that many times to where you see something and maybe uh, uh, you'll see one of your kids and they've got, uh, uh, you know, a uh, chocolate chip melted all around their face. The perception looks not in their favor, right? It doesn't look good for them. They got into the cookie jar and they got into the cookies. And, and, uh, but you don't know uh, the whole story, all right? And sometimes there's been many times as a parent that I've gotten mad at one of the kids only to find out a little bit later that my perception was wrong. And I had done wrong. I, I had falsely accused them uh, because of my perception. And they, it looked like they were guilty. It looked like they were wrong. And, uh, but they weren't. I just didn't have all the facts. I didn't have all the information. And so as a parent, I had to come to them and say, uh, you know, uh, uh, son, I'm sorry. Or girls, I, I'm sorry. That was wrong. And I shouldn't have disciplined you for that because uh, I, I jumped to a conclusion. That was wrong. I'm sorry. And uh, there were several times. Uh, or oh, I didn't do it often, but when they were little or maybe more than when they got older. There were several times when they were younger, if when I was in the wrong uh, and I perceived wrong, then I disciplined them and spanked them because of something they did wrong. But I was in the wrong. I would give them the paddle. I'd say, all right, I was in the wrong. And uh, I, you, I, I punished you wrongly, unjustly. And so you're going to get to spank daddy. Oh, boy. And uh, they, they're excited about that. And uh, really, I should have said, you can spank mommy, all right? And uh, she'll be all ready for you to get in there and do that. And so there's been a few occasions, and boy, they get down, and I bend over there, and uh, boy, I said, now remember, uh, you reap what you sow, so you better make sure that you think this through before you do it. And so there's a few times, and, and we, I'd make fun of it, but make light of it, but still the truth of the reality was fact. What? I was wrong. My perception was wrong. I punished them, and it wasn't fair. It was unjust. And so our perception doesn't always uh, mean that it's reality and that it's factual. And so uh, how I perceive something does not mean that my perception is accurate or right. As we look at this thought, uh, and uh, how that we begin to even look at perception even meaning more than reality, uh, we see that perception is not reality. Admittedly, perception can become a person's reality, but because perception has a potential or potent uh, influence on how a person looks at reality. Think of it this way. Perception acts as a lens through which you view a situation. And so how you see something is how you perceive it, but it doesn't mean that that perception uh, is uh, accurate. Uh, the practice of this is often causes us to be warped in our thinking and how we look at things. Let me give you a verse here that, that goes with that. Go to Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 12. Proverbs 14, verse number 12, and uh, we see here that the lens through which we look at life is through our sinful nature. I'm a sinner. Remember, there's no good or bad. We're just sinners. That's all we are. And as sinners, we have a fallen nature. We're depraved and are deprived and we're unable to see things clearly without the truth of God's word. So we're prone to see things wrongly. Our perception can be wrong. Proverbs 14, verse 12. Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way which what? Seemeth. Seemeth. Perception. Seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So because we're sinners, listen now, Perception is deception. Perception is deception. But that's how I see it. But if that's not what God says, that's what Satan wants you to focus on. He wants you to see, base your, your, your decisions on what you see. But faith comes by what? Hearing the word of God, not seeing. Uh, the just shall walk by faith, not by sight. And so why? Because my perception uh, is deception. And so what I see is not going to be valid and accurate and truthful. And so it's true that someone's perception will influence how they see and respond to the situation. But it's not true that perception creates reality. Perception does not change facts. 
It does not change reality. It doesn't change the realness of the situation. Just because you perceive it to be different doesn't mean it's different. And the truth is still truth. And so there's a danger of equating our opinions and perceptions and feelings uh, in those, uh, those type of areas uh, of our life. And so really the way we should replace perception with reality is this way. Perception is a personal view of reality. Perception is not reality. It's your view. It's my view of reality. In this way, the nature of truth is not diminished because of one's perception, no matter how convincing or sincere that perception uh, may be. Because the Bible says, uh, he that trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely shall be delivered. What's that mean? You trust in what? Your heart, your, your perception. But that's how I see it. That's how I look at it. That's how it is. But God, listen, there's a lot of ways, a lot of times things come into your life and say, well, God doesn't love me. And Satan will say, if God was such a good God, why do you do that? And why do you allow that? And if God is so caring and loving, then why are you going through all this pain and suffering? If God is such a loving God, why? And all of a sudden, he's trying to get us to look at the situation, the circumstance of our life, and have a perception that's a biased perception that God doesn't love me because of the bad that's happening in my life. But my perception does not change the love of God. God loves me whether I perceive his love or not. God's good whether I perceive his goodness or not. And so that's what we want to finalize where the Bible says, and the truth, John 8, 32, and the truth shall make you free. You know, truth is very difficult to hear, but it's the only liberating information that will set you free. Uh, we're in bondage to the extent that we don't want to hear truth. And that's why churches like ours uh, are, are, are sort of in the minorities because uh, folks want to come to a place and worship and, and learn about things that have nothing to do with truth that challenges their lifestyle and so we remain in bondage and it's a truth that sets us free even as uncomfortable as that truth might be. And so we need to hear the truth and that sets us free. So I said, number, the next thought I said uh, was this, I'm building on that, bad things happen to good people but your perception not necessarily is that which is reality. Uh, don't allow that to be that. My perception uh, of good is not an accurate evaluation of good. Let me give you the next couple of thoughts and we'll be done. Here's the next one. Bad things happen because we make bad decisions. Bad things happen because we make bad decisions. Um, in our brokenness, in our fallenness as sinners, we make bad decisions. Even if our intentions are good. Even if they're sincere. And uh, you know, sincerity doesn't remove the wrongness of a decision. Uh, good intentions doesn't take away the pain that comes because of a wrong decision. And uh, many of us can look back at life and say, but you know, I was so sincere in making that decision. And boy, it sure caused a lot of pain. Or my intentions were at best when I made that. But boy, it sure caused a lot of hurt and heartache. And so bad happens to good people uh, because we make just bad decisions. And uh, we're not the best at making the best decision. When bad choices are made, bad consequences follow. It's, it's no different than cause and effect. And uh, uh, now what happens when those bad consequences come? Sometimes we blame God. Sometimes we get mad at God. And God says, why are you mad, mad at me? You're the one that made that choice. And uh, we do reap what we sow. That sometimes is a good thing we sow and we reap the good. Sometimes we reap the, reap, sow the bad and we reap the bad as a result of that cause and effect. And so we need to look at, okay, the life situation you're in now that's a bad situation. What are maybe some of the choices that you made that brought you to that situation? Now, it's so easy to blame someone else for the problems I'm in today than to blame myself. But oftentimes the problems I find myself in today I'm the one that caused that problem in my life. You're the one that caused that problem in your life. Look at this verse. This, this is a great verse. Go to uh, Proverbs um, uh, 19. Proverbs 19 and uh, verse number 3. When we make bad decisions, very few of us want to take ownership for those decisions. We suffer from those decisions. And so we blame God. We get mad at God. And I'm the one that made the choice. I'm the one that made the decision. But God's the one that gets all the flack uh, and slack because of that. Look in Proverbs 19, 3. The foolishness of man perverteth his way. And uh, no matter how intense you are to do the right thing, when you're foolish, and what's a fool? A foolish in his heart, there is no God. 
And so when you live your life to where you're the God of your life and God's not the God of your life, you're a fool. And I've also defined it this way. A fool is not just one, as the Bible says, that, say, that uh, believes that there is no God, but a fool is someone that says no to God. Not just there is no God, but they say, no God, I'm not going to do it your way. And uh, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to act that way. I don't want to forgive. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And you say no to God. That's foolish. It's going to what? Pervert your way. But notice the next thought of the verse, verse 3 of chapter 19 of Proverbs. And his heart fretteth against the Lord. What's that mean? He gets mad at God. He blames God for the perverted way that he's on because of the foolishness of his own making. And his heart gets mad. It frets. It gets upset with God. And who made those choices? The fool. The fool is the one that does his own thing, lives his own way, his own life. The hardships come, the problems come, and then he gets mad at God. He frets at God and says, God, why have you allowed this in my life? And God says, why are you blaming me for the choice? You made it. You made that decision. And that we pray to God. And so before you start asking God uh, why God is doing something to you, it might be worth asking if your circumstances are simply consequences of a bad choice, of a bad decision uh, that you've made. Next one. Bad things happen. Next one. Uh, because other people make bad choices. Bad things happen because other people make bad choices. Sometimes bad things happen when other people make bad decisions. You might be a great driver, but someone else makes a bad choice. And, um, you know, you go through, remember back when you went through a driver's training and they showed the videos and the drunk drivers and the cars mangled and, and all twisted around and everything else. And so you could be a great driver, but someone made some bad choices and they find themselves out on the road and uh, intoxicated and and uh, now you get in a car accident and now bad comes your life you've got some health issues or uh, your car needs repair or you've got extra bills that have to be cared for and you've got maybe a loss of a life here and something else happened and all these things and you're a great driver but something bad happens because sometimes others do things that are not the best they make bad decisions uh, we live in a sinful world uh, and so because of Adam and Eve uh, they ate of that forbidden fruit. They decided to disobey God. And guess what happens? We're oppressed by one man. Sin of the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And so all that we're going through today is because of a choice that was made from someone else. A decision someone else made as a result of that. And so sometimes uh, we recognize uh, that death came through Adam's wrong choice and now our world is shaped by it. So bad things happen because I make a bad choice. Bad things happen because others make a bad choice. Many of you today are going through some really hard times, and it wasn't any choice you made. It was a choice that, that someone else made. Maybe, you went, maybe you're a child reared in a, a divorced home or an abusive home or, or whatever it might have been. It wasn't a choice you made. Uh, that wasn't your fault or your cause as much as you like, you know, the devil wants you to convince you it was your fault because this happened or that happened, but you found yourself in a very hurtful situation outside of your control. Choice or decision someone else made. Next one, bad things happen when we experience God's discipline or God's judgment. Because the Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. When anything bad happens in our, li in our lives, one of the first things we ought to ask and evaluate in our own heart, God, is there something in my life that's displeasing to you, that's causing this problem in my life to get my attention so I can sort of make some changes in my life? Uh, and say, well, it's just been a rough week. It's been a, a bad walk this week. And boy, it's just been a hard year this year. Instead of just sort of throwing it out there, why don't you say, well, I wonder if there's something that I'm doing that's causing a loving God to bring chastening into my life. The word chastening is chastisement. There's three ways that God chastens his children. The first way he chastens us is through his word. It's called conviction. You come to church, hear the truth. When the truth is spoken, it makes you feel uncomfortable. You say, wow, boy, I'm not doing that. I'm not loving that, living that way. Well, I didn't know that was expected of me. Boy, and it makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. That's the chastening of God's word. That's why it's so important to be in a Bible preaching church is so that God, through his word, can chasten you and convict you and say, listen, you got to straighten up in this area. You got to fix this area. You got to get this thing right in your life. And, and so he chases you through his word. Now, the next stage of chastening 
is through the, the, the um, uh, woodshed. So first is through the word. The second is through the woodshed. Remember the woodshed? Some of you old folks remember the woodshed. The younger generation maybe has no idea what the woodshed was. But uh, we, when we lived in San Joaquin Valley, we had a beautiful tree. And I built a fort up there, climbed up in that fort. It was one of my uh, best uh, places of refuge until I did wrong because it was a weeping willow tree. And uh, uh, Dad would say, all right, you go get a branch. And boy, those weeping, with those weeping willow branches, I mean, they are long, and, and you, you just, you know, rip off the leaves on that thing, and boy, I mean, they, they get that whip action going, and, and uh, it, it can leave a, a you know, a, a memorable experience uh, when that encounter took place. And so, that weeping willow, on many, many occasions, boy, I'd have to go out, and I'd have to pull my own weapon that was going to be used against me. Think of that. Uh, injustice there. And uh, uh, my, my folks probably would have been, you know, uh, social services. Everybody would have zeroed in on them that, back then, you know, back in our days. We wouldn't have even been able to make it through, huh, uh, back in the day. And so, but I was disciplined. Why? Because my mom and dad, they loved me. And so I'd go to the woodshed. And the woodshed, spiritually, is where God brings things into your life, difficulties into your life, to try to get your attention. To try to say, you know what, you're not going the right way. And that you're not doing the right things. And this isn't the proper thing to do. And, and so he's using these events, just, just circumstantial. The Bible calls it the reproofs of life. It's, it's things that happen natively that's tied to the choices that you make, the reproofs of life. And so those are things that God tries to, he tightens it down. He tightens it down. And uh, it could be, man, it seems like the car's always broken down. Or it seems like, boy, the, you, one thing after another, and this is happening here, and this over here, and they're sick. And over. It's like, what in the world? And it may be God trying to chasten us through his word. That's a preferred, because it, it doesn't have a lot of pain other than just it convicts you. But then there's a woodshed where God begins to bring events into our life, circumstances our life, to get our attention. And then the last W is the wood, wood box. God will prematurely take his children home if they're not allowing the word and the woodshed to get their attention because we're causing more harm for the cause of Christ than we are good. We're being more of a stumbling block for the cause of Christ because they, others know in your family you're a Christian. You're certainly not living like it. Others at your job, they know you're a Christian, professing Christian, but you're not living like it. And uh, you're, you're boasting and you know, just sort of taunting and just sort of doing and living your own lifestyle and proud of it, away from God. And God says, you know what, enough's enough. And we look back at some that, that were professing Christians. We look back uh, in, in our generation, maybe Elvis Presley died in the prime of his life. Hank Williams died in the prime of his life. We can look back at others. Then in the prime of their lives, their life was taken from them. But when we look at their life story, you'll see many of them were raised in good God-fearing homes, learned to sing in the choir at their church, and, and uh, you know, uh, were, were professing Christians. And then in the, in the prime and the premier pinnacles of their lives, their lives were gone. And God says, you know, you're causing more harm than good. I'm just going to take you home now. And I'm going to take you home now. And so God takes the word through conviction, the woodshed through circumstances of life, and then the wood box uh, will take us home. Why? Because he loves us. So sometimes problems is because I'm not, make, I'm not doing right. I'm not living right. I'm not doing what I ought to do. And so things are being brought into my life that are not, enjoyable they're not beneficial and God's just saying I'm trying to get your attention now notice now I'm just going to give this off the wood the word the woodshed they don't take care of the problem Jesus is the only one that can take care of the problem but the word in the woodshed reveals to us there is a problem so we can take care of the problem by saying God I'm sorry forgive me I've been I've been doing wrong and that's not right I'm sorry and when the word convicts us to where we can take ownership of it and say, God, I'm sorry. Or the woodshed gets our attention and rattles our cage and we say, God, I'm so sorry. See, it's not the conviction. It's not, it's not the, the chastisement of problems that's going to get your life right. But it can get your attention focused so you can go to the one who can get your life right and who can give you forgiveness and that's Jesus Christ. And so if your life's a little bit rough right now, uh, a good question to ask is, is there things in my life that's causing this? Are there problems that, that I'm bringing in my life, my home, my family, because of how I'm choosing to live my life? And God's revealing that to you today. Say, God, I'm so sorry. And then tell God, God, I'm sorry for, and then you tell God what that is. Don't say, forgive me for all my sins. 
because you didn't sin in bulk and you don't get forgiveness in bulk, you go to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I had a bad attitude right there, that situation. And that co-worker, I, I didn't handle that right, and I'm sorry about that. And I, I was so unkind to my wife right there, and I shouldn't have said those things. Those were so hurtful, I'm so sorry, God. And I shouldn't have been that way to my son or my daughter, and I, I'm sorry, God. And so you're specific dealing with those sins, and God says, I'll forgive and cleanse that sin. And you're forgiven. You're forgiven. And so problems sometimes come because of the chase hand of God. Sometimes bad things happen because God's testing us. God's testing us. Uh, sometimes God will lead us into times of testing. Remember in Matthew chapter 4, the Bible says the Spirit led Jesus into the, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It wasn't Jesus' idea to go to the wilderness and the desert, but the Spirit of God led him in the desert, in the, in the wilderness there, to be tempted of Satan. And so God was the one who allowed Satan to, to ravage Job. Job had, Job had everything a man could ever want, but God allowed it to be stripped away to prove that Job would not abandon his faith in times of suffering. He wouldn't turn his back on God when the hard times came. Have you considered my servant Job when confronted with Satan? So sometimes God will allow hardships in your life and problems in your life to try your faith and to test your faith like you put that uh, the hot water uh, does not cause a problem. It, the problem is not the hot water. The hot water reveals that tea bag that goes in that hot water. It reveals the con contents of what's in the tea bag the problem is not the hot water it shows what it produces and so the trial is not your problem the hardship's not your problem it's what that hardship's producing through the tea bag of your heart it's what's coming out of your life your your words your actions your behaviors and so our response uh, to God uh, who loves us uh, should be a patience and a faithfulness uh, to God. Our commitment to Him, to Him should not be based on how happy our circumstances are, but on how happy God is and how we're dealing with those circumstances. And so uh, we look at that. Then let me give this other thought. Go to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter number 9. We're almost through. John chapter 9, just trying to get through these. Why do that? When bad things happen to good people, uh, we begin to focus. Again, that's a faulty question, and we could just end on that one thought there, but there's other reasons that we can evaluate. Okay, bad things are happening in my life. Why? Is it a choice I've made? Is it choices others have made? Uh, is it on the judgment of God? Is God trying to get my attention because I'm not living right? I'm not doing right? Do I need to confess some sin in my life to God? What is it? Why is things happening like this? Is God testing me? Is he putting me in a position to reveal to myself how spiritual I really am? Uh, you know, testing doesn't reveal to God how spiritual you are. It reveals to you how spiritual you are. You go through a hard time. God knows where we are spiritually. He knows where we are. But sometimes we think we're a little bit more spiritual than we are. We're all there. We all are there. No, I'm a good Christian. I'm a this, I'm a that. And we think we're pretty good. And then God brings some testing in our life to reveal to us, to humble us, to say, you're not maybe as spiritual as you thought you were. Because the way you've reacted in this situation is not really a godly reaction. The way you've dealt with this situation is not really the best way to deal with this situation. If you were spiritual, to the extent you think you're spiritual, you wouldn't have responded this way. And so the testing comes revealed to us, uh, those type of things. But notice this other one, John chapter 9, look in verse, verse number 1. And as Jesus, get my glasses here. And as Jesus passed by, uh, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. John chapter 9, look at verse 1. Uh, and passed by from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? Here we go. Why? Why are bad things happening to this, this person? He's been blind since his birth. It's not his fault. He was just a little kid, blind from birth. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents. Notice how, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Sometimes bad things happen to provide God an opportunity to manifest his power in your life. Sometimes bad things happen so that God can manifest his power in life. He says, this, this, boy, this boy is a baby to a young man now that's blind from birth. He did no sin. His parents, they did no sin. Who was in the wrong? Why is he blind? What were they thinking? Why did bad things happen to good people? And they says, no, it, he, it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his mom and dad's fault. And he goes on to say, it was so that what? It was so that, um, that God uh, should be made, the works of God should be made manifest in him. 
And so Jesus rejected the idea that all suffering must be punishment for sin. God's power may be manifest immediately through healing or through the slow spread of disease rather than a quick spread. Look for the display of God's power in your affliction. You say, but God healed me. All right, praise be to God, God's power. But God's not healed you. So God's manifesting the works of his power to show that he can give you a good attitude through what you're going through that's so hard. He can keep you on top side and positive even though it's a very negative time that you're going through. And there's no, and you, we all can testify this, there's no greater testimony that we have than looking at others that are going through a hard time and seeing them stay faithful to God, keep a good upper lip and a good focal point on God. They're not angry at God. They're not mad at God. They're the, they, you go to encourage them. They encourage you. Uh, they're on top side. They're, they just have a love for God. There's a sweet spirit that just sort of overflows and over abundance in their heart. What is it about them? And they just sort of draw us near. They show what? Wow. The power of God at work in their lives. Because there's no way you're going to show that. Look, anybody can be happy and bright, bright in God when you're getting the awards, when everything's going the way you want it. You got the promotion, you got the this, you got the that. Yeah, whoo, God's good. And we thank God for the works of God in those areas. Oh, but look about the works and the power of God at work when you're going through some hard times and difficult times. So God's power may be uh, manifest in healing, but God also may be doing it a different way. Look for how God's power is being manifest in your affliction. Maybe you're able to interact with people you would have never interacted with had you not been ill, had you not been sick. I was with Brother Nikolai's, and um, he wanted a couple of tracks. I said, hey, take these tracks right here, and as you talk to your nurses and doctors come in, I said, you just pass those on to them. And what was he want to do? He was wanting to, make, listen, those folks that he wouldn't have maybe knocked on the door, he may wouldn't have never talked to them, but because of his health issue right now, he's in the hospital, and why he's there, he's going to let the works of God, the power of God be manifest. He's going to spread out that information of good God's goodness, even during a difficult time, and uh, through all of those different things. I was there, and his doctor came in, and he says, doctor, he said, I want you to meet my, my spiritual doctor. This is Pastor Ralston. And, uh, and, uh, and that's what it is. As a pastor, you're a spiritual doctor. What? To encourage your faith, to strengthen your faith, to give you the direction, the guidance, and the truth from God's Word, to keep you going the right direction. And so we see that. And then we see this. Bad things happen sometimes to remove our boasting. Bad things happen to remove our boasting. Affliction reminds us that we're not self-sufficient. We need to rely on God. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul said, Lest I should be exalted above measure proud, except to be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. God had revealed so much to him. The Bible goes on to say in Revelation, there's 2 Corinthians 12, 7, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Preacher, why are proud, why do good, bad things happen to good people? Sometimes to keep us humble, keep us grounded, because we can become a little bit proud because of God's goodness, because of our health, because of our strength, because of our financial stability, because of our this, that, whatever it is. And we get a little bit proud and thinking that we're the ones that built this empire. We're the ones that accomplished this. And God says, don't ever forget, it's not you, it's, it's, it's me, it's God. And so Paul says, I was getting in positions where I could have been very exalted. Look what God's shown me. He didn't show it to you. Look what I've seen. You've not seen it. And so to keep him from being lifted above measure, God just grounded him a little bit. He had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it is. Some think it was a, a limp that he had the rest of his life. Some think it was a speech impediment that he sort of began to stutter, and that, that affected him as he interact, you know, communicated to people. We don't know something. It was a, a hearing issue or something. We don't know what it was, but it was a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. To keep them on them. So sometimes bad things happen to good people just to keep them in a place that God continues to use them. And then lastly, I'll just say this. Sometimes bad things happen to help our sanctification. To help our sanctification. It allows us to have a greater intimacy with God. Uh, it can help a believer stop sinning. It can produce perseverance in our heart. Uh, it can give us opportunities to imi uh, imitate Christ in our life. It allows us to be more set apart unto God. All that will live godly shall suffer persecution. And so I don't, I don't know uh, why, when we ask that question, why do good things, bad things happen to good people? Why? It just seems so unfair. I know, same thing. But hopefully this week and last week, taking our point, eight or ten points together, we've looked at, we can say, you know what? 
God is good. And, and, and goodness is not based upon whether it's good for me and not good for me that God's good. God's good, that's it. It's settled. It's not, I believe, you know, God, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. It's God said it, that settles it. God's good, that settles it. it doesn't, whether I agree or believe or not, it's God's good. And so don't go through life with this martyr complex of why me and all life's so hard and I'm just going through such a hard time. I'm just trying to be a good Christian, just trying to be, you know, serve the Lord, just trying to do the right thing. And there's all these problems. Okay, there's a checklist we can go through. Is it sin in my life? Am I getting a little bit proud in some areas of my life? You know, is it the power of God at work in my life? Is God just trying to test me? Is God trying to reveal to me how spiritual I really am when I think maybe I'm more spiritual than I really am? And what, what, is it a choice that I'm making? Is it a choice that other people have made? Uh, it, they're really, it's a, it's, not a, uh, it's a faulty question. And because there is really none good, we're all sinners. And, you know, and then we begin to look at all this and say, you know what? God, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for whatever you allow into my life. That's why it says, in everything, give thanks. Because if God's good... And God's purpose is to accomplish good in our lives because He's a loving God, then we can be in everything, give thanks. In everything, in the midst of what you're in today, you can give thanks. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the truth of your word, Lord.